Let's just get started. Hi, everyone. We are live and we are recording. I'm Sky on behalf of Politics NY. And this is Kathy, who's our ASL interpreter. And this is fantastic. I've never, ever in my life spoken and been interpreted before in sign language. So this is a first for me. And for me. <laughs> and for Steve. This is fantastic. So thank you, Evie and team, for arranging this capability for our audience and our voters and the community. Um, Welcome everyone to Politics and Why. I'm Sky, and I'm here with Steve Witt, who's my colleague. We are the Schneps Media Politics and Why team. Schneps Media is the only media outlet providing a platform for every single New York City Council candidate to have their voice heard and show their faces and personalities. So here we are with District 22 in Queens. It's nice to meet you. It's nice to have you here. Many of you are familiar with my three questions in three minutes series where I've highlighted you in a fun, candid way. And for those of you that we haven't done that, this is the last week to do it. So please let's connect and do that three questions in three minutes interview. So tonight's debate will be more like a community discussion, which makes it unique. I'm sure you've participated in many debates. This will be fast and fun. So each time you speak, we ask that you just keep your answers short and sweet so Steve and I can facilitate conversation and we can cover the wide range of topics that you candidates would like to focus on. So this form is being recorded and I thank again our ASL interpreters here for providing this to the community. And you can watch this recording on politicsny.com slash debates. And everything's on our website, politicsny.com. Meet the candidates, the debates, everything. So here we are, District 22. Let's get right to it with the candidates. They are vying for Costa Constantinidis seat, which encompasses Astoria, East Elmhurst, Jackson Heights, and Woodside. And we will begin by introducing them. You're going to introduce yourselves, candidates. We'll go in alphabetical order with last name. So Leo would be first, but is he here? Yes, he is. And real Leonardo quick. Bellaro. And because we so have gonna, so many people here, the introduction add. is like an elevator pitch, 40 seconds. Um, you know, I'll give you a little leeway, but we have so many candidates. The, the intro has to be fairly brief, please. All right, fantastic, thank you. So let's start with Leo. Hi folks, thank you so much. I'm sorry, I was having a little bit of technical difficulties. Thank you for organizing. I wanna say hi to my fellow colleagues. I hope you're staying safe on the campaign trail. My name is Leonardo Bellaro, and I'm here to ask for your support in the upcoming Democratic primary. I am the son of Sicilian immigrants, uh, first generation born. They arrived in the district in 1959, really in pursuit of the American dream. I have dedicated my life to public service. I have 15 years experience in the field of education. I was a co-founder of a New York City high school. I led a nonprofit and I also worked at the Department of Education Office of Innovation. And I'm really running for city council to that shot at the American dream seems harder and harder each year. And I'm running to make that possible for the folks of New York City. Uh, my campaign is focused on creating more access and opportunities for folks and investing in the economy as we turn the corner. Some of the things I'm calling for is direct funding straight to schools so we can pay for more after schools, more social workers, investing in job training. Folks have lost their work during COVID. How can we get them into new growing fields? Investing in the economy by our infrastructure projects and as well as our uh, new green uh, economy that's growing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Now, Tiffany Caban, add spotlight. Hey, y'all. I'm Tiffany Caban. Uh, I'm a public defender, organizer, activist. I'm a queer Latina raised by an elevator mechanic and a caretaker, and above all else, someone who builds with my community. I've built the biggest, most diverse coalition of over 50 community orgs, labor unions, and electeds ready to fight for working families in our community. I'm running for council because this is where the work is. You know, a friend said to me, everyone tells you it takes a village to raise a child, but who is uplifting and supporting the village? And that's the job of government. And I'm running because I know that local doesn't mean small. 
Yes, I'm gonna fill the potholes, pick up trash, trim the trees, and I'm running to be a legislator and set a budget in the largest, most powerful city government in our country. We're in the middle of a global pandemic, a police violence pandemic, a climate crisis, but the definition of a crisis is a turning point. And this moment is pregnant with possibility. We don't have to settle for small reform. We have an opportunity for solutions scaled to the size of our problems. And I have plans to do that and build back better, right? And you know, this is my home and I want to build the safest, healthiest communities possible together. Thank you. Thank you, I like that. Pregnant with possibility. <laughs> okay, the next person, John Chiafone. Thank you all. Thank you for this wonderful forum. Uh, I'm also uh, a son of an immigrant. I was literally born in Astoria Boulevard Hospital. I worked here basically all my life, uh, raised a family, children. And I'm running because um, I, I think all the candidates here have publicly said they want to defund the police. And, and all we need to do is watch the news, read, read the newspapers and see what's going on. Uh, there is a, a war outside where the criminals are leading uh, the effort here. Uh, we have de demonized our police. Um, the city council has defunded the police. This mayor is proposing the largest budget ever in this city's history, and yet they want to continue to defund the police. They don't talk about defunding any other agency. They don't talk about defunding the city council, a part-time job. What part-time job do you know gets over 150,000 a year? Uh, I'm not sure you could name one. So let's be honest here. Uh, we need to support the police. We need to make sure our communities are, are safe. Our community is only as good as the safety we feel every day as citizens here in our homes, on our streets, in our schools, in our parks, and in our communities. And we cannot allow uh, people running or even people in office right now to uh, demonize and defund our police. Eliminate jails. What are we going to do? Put our criminals in hotels uh, like they've done with the homeless people? And then the abuse of our children, the abuse of our children, keeping them out of school, causing them to suffer mental uh, issues of depression and suicide because they're not in school. They're not socializing. Why? We're putting the interests of Thank teachers and special sorry. interests above students. Gonna have to I'm sorry, I went over. I know, sorry to cut you off. And and I know someone just chatted and said that because I was spotlighting the who's speaking, they couldn't see the ASL interpreter. So now I won't spotlight the speakers. Yeah, we just have the screen. Kathy right, right. here on the screen. Okay. <laughs> Kathy. <laughs> okay, fantastic. <laughs> Katarina next. Great. Hey, thank you so much. I'm Katarina Kat Gioina. I was born and raised in the story of Queens. My parents are immigrants. They immigrated here in the 90s. Uh, we all have that great immigrant story, so I love it and we can all get out of the way. Uh, I'm running because, again, I went to school here. I went to every single school, that, or every single church, or every single store you could think of. I walked every block in the street in this district, let alone in the larger part of northwestern Queens. I love here. I'm not planning on going anywhere. I am the youngest person within this screen right here running um, it's because I'm running because I know that whether or not I'm going to die in the next 80 years, my kids will be living here in Astoria and the people after them will be living there in Astoria. I studied extensively urban policy and actually trying to get a physical change in the city at Columbia University, got a full ride there. And if we don't start now making an actual physical change to our city, uh, frankly, then we won't change the city at all. We have to actually see tangible change within our city. We have to see tangible change within our district. I don't need to say this, but our district alone is third least most green space, has the third least most green space in the entire city. We have 16 square feet of space. If we don't actually just make ourselves have a breathable, livable society, which we saw we needed during COVID, then we won't ever do it again. Now, people, whoever's running, whoever is the elected officials, whoever I hope wins on the screen, uh, they will be in charge of basically changing drastically the city. And if we don't actually start, it will never happen again because you will have, and I argue, the most amount of power and autonomy as a city council member within the next eight years, if not four years, to enact and, and actually execute change unless you would just do the status quo and argue about other social changes, which we also need, but we need physical change more. So at the end of the day, uh, we need public spaces. And thank you, and I'll see you soon. Thanks so much everyone for keeping it short and sweet. Now next is Evie. 
Hi everyone, I'm Evie Hansopoulos, of course, running for city council here in District 22. Thank you so much, um, Politics NY, for, for doing this uh, debate and forum. I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. And thanks to my fellow candidates for chipping in for the ASL interpreters, really appreciate that. I am the daughter of immigrants who came to this country as adults. Um, they were both working class. My dad was a cabinet maker. My mom was a garment worker. I was the first in my family to graduate from high school and go on to college. I moved to this district in 1999 and have been an active community organizer, um, organizing with people from all walks of life here, folks in NYCHA, immigrants, young people, parents on issues like housing justice, education, supporting our small businesses, and then also during COVID doing lots of COVID relief. I am a founding member of the Astoria Mutual Aid Network and also co-founded an organization called Frontline Foods Cleans. So I am running because we are at a precipice. We need to take experience, we need to take ideas um, and the ability to bring people together to work for collaborative change so this can be a city where everyone lives in dignity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Evie. And next we have Felicia, who is running as a Republican. But again, we invite everyone on behalf of Schneps Media and Politics and why we include all voices for each council seat. So Felicia. Thank you so much, Sky and Politics and why it's an honor to be here. Um, again, Felicia Kaland here. I'm running to put people before politics and I'm running to champion the needs of our community with common sense solutions like John, I don't wanna defund the police. I'm on the ground asking the community, what are you looking for in a city council person? And time and time again, I hear people are scared with the rise in crime. So so public safety is going to be a huge priority for me. Um, my background, I'm a former legislative aide. I'm also the co-founder of a nonprofit called Unchained. It was so a social enterprise. We actually did artistic fashion shows across the nation that told the story of human trafficking and domestic violence. I also helped co-found a novel, which was an ethical clothing line. Um, I'm an innovator by nature. I'm also the former VP of a company called Cohatch. Uh, we had a social enterprise incubator space and we had that model in several cities across the country and I want to bring that professional experience to reboot and revitalize our local economy. I want to unleash the creative spirit of Astoria and of Queens, Woodside, Jackson Heights, all of our communities in District 22. Um, I'm excited to run. I'm a mom. Um, I'm ready to be the voice of people who've long been forgotten. The voice of moms, the voice of parents. I understand firsthand I have a six and four year old um, that I've been teaching during the pandemic. Um, I want to run to ensure that my children and all kids in District 22 have the best possible future. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you so much. Thank you. And last but not least on the screen here is Nick Velkov. Hi, thanks so much. My name is Nick. I'm a yoga instructor. Now, the reason I'm running for city council is because I have some ideas that I want to share that I think will significantly improve our physical and mental health. Um, I think we're living under a government structure that, quite frankly, makes us pretty sick. Um, you know, we don't have a housing for all policy, and that just means we have a lot of homelessness and housing insecurity. That makes a lot of people sick, obviously. Uh, we don't have progressive enough tax codes. We're putting a tax burden on low and middle income people. We're giving tax abatements to the wealthy. That's going to stress out a lot of people and the stress is going to make them sick. Uh, we've got racism, racial profiling. We've got harassment of LGBTQ kids. That harassment is traumatizing and that trauma manifests into physical and mental illness. Now, these are some serious government structural changes we have to make if we want to tilt the needle back toward better public health. But in addition, to these structural changes, we have to make some serious individual lifestyle changes. We have to exercise, we have to meditate, and we have to breathe better. I'm dead serious about this. If we live sedentary lifestyles without physical, without physical exercise, doesn't matter how good our housing security is, we're going to the hospital with preventable illnesses. If we're not learning, like leaning into this mindfulness stuff that they've been talking about for centuries, I don't think the tax code is going to matter. As humans, we're still going to fight with each other over stupid things. We got to breathe better. We got to breathe through the nose. I'm telling you, the science is there. Don't breathe through your mouth. Breathe through the nose. It'll help your blood pressure. It'll help your brain tissue. It's brutal. 
but no politicians want to talk about it. I do want to talk about it. I think it's very important that we talk about it. So I'm running for city council to talk about health and wellness. And if you vote for me, it would kind of be like an amazing political revolution if you're into that sort of thing. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> I remember first learning about Nick and the and the yoga background during my three questions in three minutes. And now it seems like it's developed into quite a platform, Nick. It's exciting. Thank you so much. I'm excited <laughs> about it too. Okay, now the most contentious issue here really, I think is about the NYPD. So if you guys don't mind, let's jump into that and talk about the different opinions. And I think it's very interesting from an objective perspective about this district to have so many different people who want to do such different things when it comes to the NYPD in one area. So let me do this. We and we'll to... have one minute. And again, I'll, I'll let you go a little bit over, but- Okay, you wanna go in the same order, just opinions about the police and why? Yes. Okay, Leonardo. Yes, thanks, Guy. So my 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 vision on on public safety for far too long we've asked our officers to be the first responder in all instances of homelessness mental health drug addiction i am all for accountability i think anyone who serves the citizens of new york need to be held accountable and their work needs to be transparent but we need to allow the police to focus on what they are good at and the jobs that we don't want to do. And that is infiltrate gang violence, find trends in crime, and get guns off the streets. So my platform actually doesn't call for defunding the police. It actually calls for piloting an innovation or expanding an innovation that's called a co-responder model. So what you have is you have an expert that leads the case incident. So for instance, if there's a call for a mental health incident, that expert is there with the cop. The, the police officer is there for making sure the situation doesn't get out of hand, but they follow the lead of the mental health expert or the homeless expert. And what that has proven to show is that cases do not escalate into further violence and the people that are in need actually get the services that they are requiring. And that's a project that we're currently running and I would call for an expansion of that. Thank you. Thank you. Tiffany. I'm sorry about my phone going off so much. Uh, thank you. So I, I mean, uh, folks know that I have been very unapologetic um, about my position and our need to divest, to defund the bloated police budget so that we can finally fully fund public safety, right? I want us to have the safest, healthiest communities we possibly can. And we currently have an operating, a city operating budget of over $88 billion. And every year we see an increase in size and budget of the police force. Our police force is the, the biggest, uh, most militarized police force in our entire country. It's bigger and larger than, than lots of militaries around the world. Uh, and what I tell folks is, is that when we put our money into that outsized budget, it prevents us from putting money into the things that actually keep us safe and healthy, fully funding housing, healthcare, education, mental health care, youth and elder care programs, all of the things that contribute to safety in our communities and pointing out the fact that actually only two to 5% of what you think the police do is what they actually spend their time doing. And that's responding to violent crime. It's not interrupting, it's not preventing, it's responding to. And so we have to make sure that we are funding the solutions in our communities that keep us the safest possible. When we keep adding to the police force and, and not getting better results, but we know, for example, that when we um, have mental health responders responding to people in mental health crisis, we save lives. When we know that when we fund violent interruption groups in areas that are experiencing high incidence of gun violence, we can reduce that gun violence by anywhere from 30 to upwards of 70%. That's what we should be doing. If it saves lives, it is worth doing. We know that when we fund 10 community-based um, organizations in any community, that crime and harm goes down across the board by percentages that the police have not yet been able to achieve. And so you, we need to lean into the things that work. Hmm. Thank you, John. I think it's the number one issue. I think that <clears throat> um, everyone here is wrong about this issue. Uh, we cannot defund the police. We cannot, uh, Tiffany goes further. She'll read her platform. She wants to eliminate the police like she wants to eliminate jails. 
So what are we going to do with violent criminals? When a guy goes outside, we've had in a story over the last three weeks, we've had about three shootings of, excuse me, five shootings and three deaths. We saw what happened at, at Times Square this weekend. How do you deal with dangerous, violent people? I talk to correction officers when I go to Rikers Island. I see their fear and their concern. There are some bad people that you cannot change with um, social workers. Let's face it. Police are a deterrent. If people don't have that deterrent, they will go out and commit crimes. We're not born good. Uh, I sh we are probably born good, but we turn bad. And we need that protection. And to say, let's defund the police when every other agency in this city is growing a larger and larger in their budget. You talk about the social workers. I'm an EMT, EMS first responder. If I don't have the police backing behind me, I'm going to get killed because a lot of the emotionally disturbed people have violent tendencies and often have weapons, whether it be a gun or a knife. Don't tell me you're going to send a social worker. When a person has an illegal gun shooting, are you going to send social workers to stop that person with a rifle? They talk about reducing right. gun violence. Wait a minute. The hypocrisy is the bail law encourages guns on our streets. Let's be honest here. We will not have a good community unless we have strong police presence and we support our police. Are we keeping to a one minute? I just want to... You, we are I'm letting everybody go a little bit longer, okay. but not much. So okay. like one, I'm like ready for him to take a breath and then. I'll... Okay, great. All right. I'd like to actually uh, respond to that and also talk about how I feel about it. I mean, John mentioned the, the awful um, shooting that happened in Times Square, but Times Square is one of the most, you know, um, militarized in terms of police um, areas in the city, we have a huge police present there and that didn't stop that awful incident from happening. So more police doesn't necessarily mean that all of these things would stop. I mean, the police budget has grown over the years under de Blasio, the number of police has grown. It has not, um, it doesn't make people, certain people feel safe. And I think we need to acknowledge the way that the NYPD and research show this has targeted communities of color. And I don't think anyone wants that. And I think we have to kind of really have honest conversations about the fact that, you know, adding more police, particularly in communities of color, does not make them feel safer. And back in the 1990s, I actually did a lot of these programs that people are talking about today in terms of restorative justice, um, uh, community-led public safety, um, for over two years in the South Bronx. It was a co coalition of over 17 community-based organizations who came together to come up with a community-led public safety plan, which involved <coughs> educating people about violence, oh, figuring out how to do mediations, figuring out how to train people to negotiate, um, have negotiation skills, violence interrupters, all those kinds of things, public safety corridors, where you engage the whole community in creating a safety plan and what that could look like. And that is what we need to do. We need to take money from the police budget and invest in communities. I 100% believe that um, so that we get to the root of the problem because once the police are called, the crime has already been committed. So we need to get the root of the problem. Mm. I know, Katarina. Uh, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, just John, just wanted to quickly respond. Uh, factually, there's an error within your argument. Uh, every other agency also got defunded. Um, uh, back on to me. A uh, defunding is a terrible analogy. I'm a reporter and I'm a journalist work for the Daily News. Uh, words matter. Defunding does not mean what people have a reaction to. It literally just means restructuring the police budget. Uh, maybe I might be further than other people on the screen by asking to defund a good portion of it, if not more. Uh, but I also do agree that we don't need any new jails. And if anything, Rikers Island being a 400, piece of, uh, 400 acre piece of land that we can have as park space would be a great addition to our district. And we don't need uh, criminals in jail, quote unquote, if I think other people on the screen would also agree. Um, and let me ask you, or anyone who's attending, uh, watching this, do you think that crime happens around you? Do you think that there are shootings happening in District 22 that you have to be afraid of, that you have to have more police on the streets? Because I say yes, actually. I say that every time I bike down 35th Street where we had someone killed two weeks ago, that yeah, there should be a cop there stopping that guy from killing someone, an actual death. If I'm gonna go to Times Square, I know that odds are, if a cop is meant to be preventative, they're going to prevent crime from happening. They failed at their job last week when they permitted to stop a guy shooting at other people and a four-year-old girl. 
So cops are supposed to be preventative. Firefighters are supposed to be reactionary. You can't stop a fire before it happens, but you can't stop a crime before it happens. So cops aren't doing their jobs. That's why I'm a big part of defunding the police, essentially. Uh, at the end of the day, you yeah, have to stop a crime that's not happening. And everyone in District 22 is also very angry about, for example, farting cars. It's really angry about our trash being picked up. These are crimes, in theory. These are crimes that are being happening in our district. And cops aren't doing those kind of crimes. They're not printing that kind of crime. No worries. Yeah, it's so interesting. Everyone has a totally different viewpoint. It's really, really interesting. Felicia. So I absolutely believe we need our police on the street, especially when crime is at an all-time high. A couple nights ago, when the Times Square shooting happened, actually it was around five, um, I weeped because I have a four-year-old and I saw a police officer who was actually there on the scene, thank God, because she ran the little girl to the ambulance or to the hospital. Um, I have a four-year-old, I connected and I was impacted by that. And I wanna make sure that our kids are safe, that our streets are clean. Um, I also deeply care about racial equality. I wanna root out any racial bias in, in our police force. So I think this is a good conversation to have, um, but I don't think we need to defund the police. I absolutely believe that we need police on the ground. Um, we need to make our subway safe again. We had a 17 year old who was pushed on the tracks um, here in Astoria. Um, we need to fight the surge in hate crimes. I don't think anybody's talked about that yet. Um, it's a real issue in our community. And most importantly, we need a tri-state collaboration. There's a lot of illegal firearms coming into New York City, and we need to work with other states to combat that. Um, we have to work on multiple levels. We also need to focus on prevention. A lot of my colleagues talk about that, and I do think it's an, an important topic. We need to invest in 14 to 18 year olds. We need to invest in CBOs and community-based organizations, but we also can fund, we can fund the police and also focus on prevention at the same thank time. Thank you, Felicia. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Nick. I know everyone needs to take a deep breath. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, you know, a uh, great way to lead it off. I, uh, I was going to say that when I close my eyes and take a deep breath and visualize my perfect world, I can see a world where schools are so well funded, kids are so well educated, jobs are so plentiful with so much autonomy, resources are so evenly distributed that people are happy, compassionate, they get along so well that we don't need police. I can see this world. It's a ways away, it's gonna take a lot of work, but I can see this world. And if that means then taking some money from the militarized weapons budget of the NYPD and transferring it to a school for new textbooks, it makes sense to me because again, if we invest in these things, the need for police goes down. But what I would do, but that's long-term stuff. In the short term, the NYPD has an office of health and wellness. I love it. It warms my heart. They're teaching the cops yoga. They're teaching them mindfulness meditation. They're teaching them how to regulate their breathing. My bet would be that if we lean into that and we expand that office of health and wellness, Police misconduct will go down dramatically. People are going to get along really well. And this conversation about civilians versus police and blah, 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 I think will become a thing of the past. That's the bet I would make. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. I know it reminds me kind of when, when Paperboy Prince talks about spreading love. <laughs> I know it, it sounds beautiful. <laughs> And that is a dream world, but are we too far away? Can we get there this next council cycle? That's the question. You get there one breath at a time. Every positive affirmation is a karmic chain of events that leads to peace, 100%. Beautiful, here, let's switch interpreters now. Okay, Steve, I'll hand it over to you for the next question. Yeah, I know that the, uh, the former city council member was big on the greening of the district and uh, I believe closing the Con Ed transfer station or plant. And I'm wondering how you would like to see this city proceed uh, with a $98.6 billion in the Green New Deal um, and how you could see that money being spent, some initiatives that you would support. And before Leo speaks, I would like to say, I like when people are interactive, right? When someone said something and someone and wanted to respond because I think it helps the voters really understand the difference between your ideas. 
Um, so we welcome that type of response as long as everyone keeps it short and sweet. So Leonardo. Sure. So the reality is, is climate change is real. It's here. The effects are impacting us. We live on an island. We're surrounded by water. It's a real issue. Uh, I do support um, transitioning over to the green economy for a couple of reasons. Not only is it beneficial for us and the planet, but it's also a great economic driver. Um, I do support the renewable Rikers. Um, as we transition to new economies, we do have to work with the workforce and train the workforce because the skills are not immediate, immediately available. So some of the things that I do support in terms of not only driving towards a cleaner energy economy, uh, but also the environment is by working with folks like our unions to set up apprenticeship models or job training through our CUNY, uh, you know, our wonderful CUNY systems so that people are prepared and they're, we're transitioning over correctly. The other things in terms of the economy where I want to see money spent is I am a big supporter of composting. I'm, I'm happy to see that that program has been reinstated, but let's go further. Let's scale it. Um, a lot of our food that ends up in the uh, in our in, in our in, in our dumps, they end up uh, rotting and composting, um, and and that's what is a big contributor to our our carbon dioxide, Thank our you. emissions. Um, I would like to see that scaled, and also investing in newer models of transit. Uh, we need more efficient bus lanes. We need uh, better protected bike lanes. We need to incentivize folks coming in, uh, third party companies to do more uh, shared bike programs. Thank you. Uh, so, so that folks have more options to get around. Thank you. Thank you. What, we're talking about all things environment, Steve, or you want it more pointed of an answer? Well, all things environment, actually, I like that answer because it, it involves the city budget and certain initiatives within the city. Like we're not talking about the world, we're talking about a 98.6 billion proposed billion budget. And, and, you know, how you see some of that money siphoned. Okay. And anything specific to the district? I'm sure voters want to hear. Sure. The district. So did... Can I go? Sure. Was that you, you I don't know if there's an order. We just chime in. Okay, so I think here in this district, what we can do is look at how we can increase battery storage um, so that, you know, we harness the power of solar energy, store it in batteries and use that to transition off of fossil fuel energy. Obviously closing the power plant happens on the state level, but we can advocate for that as a city council member. But we should also be looking at things like electric car charging stations. People are gonna have cars. We wanna get cars off the road, right? Because they're not great for the environment, but electric cars, there's no place to charge it. So I've been talking to voters and they are saying, we don't even have, if we wanna get an electric car, but we can't even go anywhere to charge it. So we need to think about how we might incorporate that into our zoning um, text. Um, I think we need to do things like do a wind map. There is bladeless um, wind turbine technology and we don't need to have those big wind turbines necessarily in the future. So we should be looking at how we can use that to create more green energy. I do support renewable Rikers. Um, I do feel we need to expand our tree canopy. Um, we need to make sure that we have shade, that we address these heat islands here um, as a city that affect lower income communities. Um, we need to look at all these outdoor dinings and putting solar panels on there, really like on the ground nitty gritty things to help reduce um, our emissions and meet our goals and get our landlords to also um, incentivize them to retrofit their buildings as well so that they can also transition off of fossil fuels. So Thank those you. are some of the ideas. Thank you. Um, Tiffany, let's hear from you. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I, j I just wanna say that, you know, in our district, we house, <laughs> practically every environmental hazard that exists around the city. And so we have a, a real opportunity here to be a leader in a model. And we have been a leader in environmental justice in, in large part due to you know, our former council member Costa Constantinides. Um, and so I, I am really proud of the plan that I put together. It's on my website, kavanforqueens.com, our Green New Deal plan, entirely participatory. Um, you know, I'm really proud to be endorsed by Costa Constantinides, as well as the Sunrise Movement, Triage, and the League of Conservation voters for this plan. Um, and it's rooted in climate reparations and racial equity. 
understanding that climate justice is racial justice and that it most acutely affects our black and brown and low income communities. And right here, you know, in Rikers Island and the Renewable Rikers Plan that I support is a perfect example of that. Because in the same communities that have been over policed, over criminalized and housed on Rikers Island are the same communities that have a lot of these polluting power plants that when they come off the island, they go home to crumbling infrastructure, to lead, to high asthma rates, uh, and it's time that we do better. So we should be viewing this also as an economic recovery plan where we build out Rikers Island, store enough of that battery energy to get rid of every single dirty polluting power plant, but that we take a holistic approach because we have heat islands here, we have flood zones here. So calling for you know better, deeper investment in our public transportation systems, more green spaces, 500 more miles each of protected bike and, and bus lanes um, so that every New Yorker is within a quarter of a mile of, of one of those things. Um, and then saving the big reuse and making sure that we are ex expanding our composting in and throughout the, um, the district because we know that we have to implement all of these strategies at the same time if we are going to get to carbon neutral on time uh, to, to, to be able to, to save our planet uh, essentially. But thank you. A lot hey, I would about. just, uh, oh, sorry. Yes, who's there? Uh, you mind if I go? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, I'll, I'll do my response. Uh, very, very frankly, uh, I am the youngest, again, I'll say that, and then maybe two or three of you on screen if I would be polite, because I want to be polite. We're going to die before our parents do. I just wanted to make that very, very frank as possible, because physically, it will be just too hot. It'll be too bad to live outside. So I'm glad that everyone's saying Renewable Rikers. I'm so glad that everyone's saying, I'm really happy for CASA and I do respect him as a council member. I'm glad for his feasibility study, but don't forget, it's just a feasibility study. We're not doing anything yet. Uh, us having a Renewable Rikers platform or us having windmills and any kind of very small minute changes in trying to get renewable energy is a baby step. We have to actually make tremendous change to make sure that this city does survive post 50 years from now and we won't so if we have to build actual resilient infrastructure this means turning micros island into a clean energy producing facility it also means making it accessible as a park and also guess what making the airport runway longer so we can have an international airport and increase more money into the district and increase more jobs there you go we solve the job problem it also means increasing coastal resiliency we have to restrict new development in zones one zones two again i was born and raised here i remember during sandy we got decimated so imagine now when we're in a zone one or an elevated flood risk zone because people aren't talking about these things. We have to actually build resilient infrastructure for the future, for people who are gonna live here for maybe even less than their parents are because they just can't survive in the in an ever-changing environment. Thank and you. anything else, yeah? Ow. Don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Thank I'm you. very passionate about these things, so. I, yeah, uh, of course. Enough. John, what do you think? Yes, um, I couldn't disagree with everyone more about Rikers Island. <laughs> uh, we can make a green plant. Uh, it's been proposed in Long Island City. Uh, one of the property owners has a big piece of land on the water. He wants to make it a green uh, power plant. And I think that's a great idea. Rikers, we need to keep it a, a jail because where are we going to put all these people who are in prisons? We don't have prisons yet. They proclaim they're going to, the city's going to build four prisons in the outer boroughs other than Staten Island, but there's no money yet appropriated to it. So what if we don't get to that point? And what are we going to do? Put our prisoners in hotels like this mayor does with the homeless people. Where has that gotten this city? More crime, more dysfunction, uh, more mental uh, uh, people who have mental uh, disabilities um, in the streets. We can't allow that. I think it's a bad idea to close Rikers, but let's talk about the environment. I ran in, in 2001 and the hottest issue back then was the Astoria power plants. It's known as Asthma Alley. And Hence, 21 years, about 20 years later, we're in the same situation we were in 2001. Not one politician, whether it was a city council person, our state senator, or any other assembly person, anyone, did anything with respect to the Astoria power plants or the power plants in Ravenswood. They are the same power plants 20 years later with the same amount of asthma. Nobody talks about it. They talk about the Green New Deal and this and that, but they haven't done anything to improve this neighborhood, this community. They failed us. And Thank so you. we have the same amount of asthma we've had 20 plus years. That's why a lot of people are, are dying, Cat. So uh, let's talk about the real issues and let's be honest. 
uh, there's a lot of stuff we can do, but let's, let's be uh, honest. Let's not work with lobbyists, certain unions that have their own interests in this game, uh, but let's advocate for the people of this community. Thank uh, you. You know what? I think Nick would think that we should take all the prisoners out of Rikers and take them on a yoga retreat. <laughs> what do you think, Nick? Uh, Vipassana meditation. It does amazing for the rewiring of the brain. An island would be a perfect place for it. You step, you sit in silence and you step and step your foot on the earth. It creates an energy into the body that can reframe the brain away from criminal tendencies to compassion and love. 100%. I would love to see Rikers Island turned into a healing center like that. <clears throat> I love, I love solar panels too. I think solar panels look awesome. I love the idea of green energy. I love a green new deal for NYCHA. I love bus, I love uh, bike lanes. I love the idea of setting up a New York City public bank so that we don't use our municipal holdings to invest in fossil fuel companies. I love all that, but there's something I've learned here on the campaign trail. It's that my friends on the left make really bad individual lifestyle choices. I'm seeing too many left-wing political operatives popping off about the Green New Deal while at the same time, they're throwing away five single-use plastics in the course of one day. I don't understand it. We have to be more mindful about what we're doing at the individual level. Structural chains are absolutely necessary. We're gonna work to them, but it's never gonna work if too many people on the left are too pompous to humbly, and, and, and I make mistakes too myself. I, I'm not trying to you know, exclude myself, but we honestly, we have to get mindful. We have to get present about the individual choices we're making. And I see it a lot on the left and we just have to wake up to that um, as part of our comprehensive look at improving our environment. Thank individual you. choices really matter. Does anyone from the left want to respond to what Nick just said? Should we all just say and raise your hands that we're part of the left? I mean, like the left is a, an arbitrary a discord that we're just trying to say, like, listen, single use plastics. I don't use single use plastics. I like don't even use plastic like the water bottle. Like, oh, I, I agree with you 100%. It's yes, there's if there are hypocrites, but like I said, solar panels and wind panel mills and uh, just they're just basic baby steps we should be doing, transmission lines we should be doing more, and we're not, unfortunately. I, I should have mentioned. Present company excluded. Well, and I, I, I also want to respond to that, right? Because yeah. when we talk about that, we're like we're we're running for for an office, and so talking about the the bounds of that office, what the purpose and and what the powers of it are, what are the levers we can pull, and so you know when we talk about a, a greener city or green infrastructure, it's about as a, as a city council member building out systems uh, that incentivize practices. Um, that will affect individual behavior, but also, you know, that the government can, can take control of on a system-wide scale. We talk about this with street infrastructure all the time, taking different, right? Like we want individuals to make better, safer choices uh, on the road, in their cars, for example. But then we also say that it's the responsibility of government to build out street infrastructure that can make people behave in certain ways, right? Or make it impossible for people to behave in certain ways. Uh, and so like making sure that we are using every lever at our disposal to get the kinds of results that we need. I mean, one of the and things that the city did was exempt themselves from the Dirty Buildings Act. So, you know, we need to get our city to comply with some of the groundbreaking legislation that we've passed in terms of emissions from buildings. And that would be huge if we actually made the city comply with its own laws that it requires other people to do as well. And Felicia, we didn't get to hear from you about the environment. Thank you. So sustainability is a quality of life issue, but I also just wanna point out the temperature gauge of this conversation is a huge reason why I'm running because it's so out of touch with what's on the ground. When I take my kids to school, I'm walking through trash. Um, you know, talking about sort of cerebral ideology and some of the systems, okay, that's good conversation. But as a city council, 
a woman and as um, you know, people running for city council. Let's commit to getting the trash off of the streets. Let's commit to um, you know, building out more recyclable um, places that we can do composting and all of that. Those are good things. Let's talk about tangible goals that we can actually accomplish. And number one, we need to get the trash off the streets. We need to invest in composting. We need to get more um, areas where people can recycle in you know, some of our commercial district areas. Um, let's focus on on the ground issues that people care about. This is a quality of life issue. I also have asthma. I care about our air quality. Um, I ran a sustainable clothing line. So I, I care about this issue as well. Um, but I also wanna point out, let's talk about what we can actually accomplish and let's get the trash off of the streets. Thank you. I know we are switching interpreters. There we are. All right, look, there's only 15 minutes left and there's still a lot that we didn't even talk about. So what do we want to do, Steve, if we give everyone a concluding time? Well, let, let's do a raise your hand session or, or yes or no. All okay. Right? Um, speaking of, of, uh, of trash, the New York Times just endorsed Catherine Garcia. And uh, some of the male candidates had said, you know, oh, she'd be my first mayor. And her famous response is, hey, I don't need you to be mayor. Um, raise your hand if you, if Catherine Garcia, if you think that was a good choice for the New York Times. Or, Does no one have their hand raised? I think the New York Times should have done a ranked choice endorsement. They shouldn't have just done one person, so. I, don't think I, I agree. I agree. Catherine Garcia is on my list too, but you know, we're, we're in a ranked choice election this year. So. I see. Um, so do you have a yes or no, uh, Sky? If Scott Stringer should drop out of the race. Yes or no? Oh, raise your hand. Yes. Yeah, I think he should drop out. Yes. Yeah, I, I actually want to try. I know it's yes or no, but I want to take 20 seconds to create some some discourse here because I think it's really Im important. Like, yes. listen, if it, if it were me, if I were in a position, I'd drop out of the race. Um, but we're at a, a moment in time, I think, when we're finally reckoning with a, a culture of abuse. And, um, you know, I think it's crucial that we believe women when historically powerful people, uh, men particularly, have, have ignored us. Uh, and that the, the Me Too movement has been about making sure that men are held accountable and women are heard and believed. Uh, and that is all not at the exclusion of, of due process and investigation and fair procedures. Because um, I'm a public defender, you know, like I, I, at the core of it, like I believe in process and I believe in holding people accountable. And I believe that when power is uh, abused, we need to make sure access to that power is removed. Uh, and we need to create space for survivors to name whatever it is that they need to heal. But, but you think due process, Tiffany, should play? I, I'd like to talk too. I mean, uh, we have a double standard in our, uh, our political community. Everybody and their brothers jumped on Andrew Cuomo to resign, uh, but that didn't happen with Scott Stringer. Okay, it was one woman, but her description of what he did was as, as uh, crazy as what uh, other women have complained that Cuomo did to them. Um, and he was the first guy who, one of the first people who jumped on top of Cuomo. So we're, they're all hypocrites. And I, I just don't understand. And I'll, I'll talk about the people in my party, the Democratic Party, where they jumped on Brett Kavanaugh, the United States Supreme Court <coughs> Justice, that he was guilty. He was guilty. He was guilty. Whether it was the vice president or the president, mm -hmm. anyone else, he was guilty. There was no evidence. Tiffany talks. She's right about due process. There was completely no evidence. But everybody said he was guilty particularly the Democrats. I'm not a Democrat. So there's a terrible double standard, a disingenuous and dishonesty that is, that is really disgusting and, 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 and needs to be addressed. And these people need to be put out of office. Sorry, we have to have was what was disgusting, but I'm not, I'm not sure why we're talking about the Supreme Court right now, but I, I didn't actually see, no, did everybody- It's an example. Think, an example. Yeah. Did people think yeah. that Scott Stringer should stay in the race? I couldn't really see everybody. I just am curious. What, what's everybody? your view on that, Edith? I think he should drop, I think he should have dropped out. I said it publicly. Yeah, I see, okay. I, just I would say as an act of compassion, I think he's been in politics way too long. He seems kind of like a grumpy old man and it would be for his own good that he step out of this arena 
and you do some deep breathing and you get his brain in order. I'd say the same thing of Andrew Cuomo. He's like a grumpy old man. He's not that cool. It would be for his own good as an act of compassion. I would say, listen, man, you got to step away from this. It's, ter- it's eating you alive. Don't do this. Step aside and hand the levers of power to normal, compassionate people who are happier and will do a better job. I put Scott Stringer in that mix. I put Cuomo in that mix. There's a lot of grumpy old men in politics. It's, I really hope I don't become one. I don't, maybe I'm already becoming one. I hope not. But, uh, you know, I'd say for their own good, they should definitely drop out. And for the good of those that they have harmed. I'm sure. glad there's discourse on this, but also don't forget that any single time, like you're perpetuating this idea that for, or allegedly a large percentage of women who come forward about these things are lying, which is not true at all. 2% of all people who come forward about any crime are liars. So don't ever perpetuate that kind of ability. Again, I think you should have resigned. I think anyone who's accused of anything should resign immediately or again, with due process, come up with very good, very, very strong proof that they have not been alleged to have to commit those crimes. Uh, again, as a former reporter for the Daily News, I don't need to, to tell you how I was a 19 year old when you can Google our editor, why he was fired from the Daily News. So again, don't, don't let's just, whenever, if someone's alleged of something, unless they actually have a good excuse or they can just say, I'm going to make a new revolution as he did while he was outside of a park in Brooklyn last week. That's uh, frankly like not good enough for, for me personally. I, I also want to say I'm kind of appalled that the conversation went to due process instead of let's recognize that a survivor of sexual harassment in the work for, in the workplace, um, you know, that we're not championing her and her voice. And instead it's defending someone who should absolutely step out of this very place. Okay, Sky, I think it's time for final comment. Yeah, let's do final comments, find concluding thoughts, and maybe advocate for yourself. Why should the voters pick you? Um, let's start with Nick and go backwards from our usual order. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, uh, I think I'm the best fit for this office. Um, I'm a small business owner. I'm not like a politics guy. I'm not into like fundraising and endorsements and all that stuff. Uh, I just like to create good relationships. Um, I think it's a very necessary perspective. I really believe that like, you know, the energy of the office is going to permeate into uh, policy and uh, material evolution. And um, I think I've been doing the work to maintain the highest level of compassion and empathy in my mind that I can. I've got a lot of work to do. I'm not enlightened yet. Maybe in this lifetime, maybe not. We'll see where the journey takes me, but I'm doing the work. I'm really doing the work to be a good human. Um, I believe everybody here is doing the work to be a good human in their own way. Um, But I think the stuff that I'm doing is kind of like backed by like centuries of ancient, ancient texts. I've dug them up. The secrets have been revealed to me. I'm using them. And um, I think it would be a breath of fresh air to have me at the Florida City Hall talking about a policy of nose breathing. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you, Sky. Um, You know, I'm the common sense candidate in in this race. I'm a mother of two. I understand exactly how hard it is to raise a family in this city um, with the cost of living. I understand firsthand what it's like to have to, you know, have your kids out of school. I want to represent um, my community, not the, not, you know, a socialist agenda or Republican agenda or a Democrat agenda. Truly, I want to represent real people on the ground um, who have issues and I want to fight for them at City Hall. I think our politicians are out of touch with what's happening on the ground. And I want to be head of constituent services. I want to fight for our community. This is the place I'm raising my family and I want to fight for your family too. Thank you. Thank you, Evie. So I actually have real on the ground experience, both in this community and in the city on some of the key issues that I think are facing our city right now. I mean, we didn't even get to talk about affordable housing. We didn't get to talk about education. We didn't really talk about how we're gonna support our small businesses and the arts, which make up a huge chunk of this community. So I am ready to do that. I have chaired the housing committee on community board one. I am the mom of three kids who all went to public schools. I have been a PTA president. I have run a nonprofit that has worked in public schools. I've been there for 25 years, managed a budget um, of over $7 million, 100 employees. I know how to provide constituent services and I also know how to work on policy because I have done that as well. I worked on stuff here in the community. I have worked on stuff citywide. I am ready day one to go in and get the job done. So um, 
I love this community. Um, I really want to bring my passion, my energy, my skills, my experience, um, and my deep commitment to, um, to really making sure that this is a city where everyone has an opportunity to thrive and we have um, true equity. So thank you. Thank you. Katarina. Uh, again, just wanted to say thank you again for listening and, and just inviting both of us or all of us here. Um, again, I was born and raised in Astoria. I don't have any intentions of leaving anytime soon, so I want to make it better for anyone else. Um, this year alone, we saw people who are privileged enough to work from home, so they're going back home to places that are not in Astoria, and they're leaving our district, and they're previously are seeing the brain drain. And if we don't have anything to basically procure those people from coming back into our district, then we won't have any other issues like affordable housing, like education to deal with, because we won't have people living here. Uh, that's essentially why I'm running, is because if we don't physically change our city, we don't make it better for the people who actually want to live here, we won't have a city to begin with. It's, but no longer is the city of all people have looked to when they, like my parents, left in their homes in the 90s to come live here because there's no reason. It's no, you can have opportunity elsewhere. We don't have opportunity here alone. It's not just the only private ship uh, part of it. Um, but again, frankly, I, I guess I was a former reporter for the Daily News. I spoke to everyday New Yorkers across all five boroughs. I know the problems that they're facing. I speak every day to my neighbors and I'm again, like everyone else here, canvassing every day. We know issues are affecting us. We know what needs to get done. Simple solutions for simple problems. Gotta just figure them out. And I'm the best person to whack, have a whack at it. Thank you guys, I right? appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thank you, uh, Sky, Steve, Schneps, for having this event, very important. Um, our elected officials have failed us. All they have to brag about is uh, marijuana passage law, prostitution, which they're gonna pass pretty soon, they're gonna legalize it, and uh, sports betting. Uh, we've done nothing but hurt and damage and abuse our children, whether keeping them out of schools for the interests of the teachers union where they had the opportunity to get vaccinated above and before everyone else so our kids could go back. They stopped that, causing great mental dysfunction, depression, and even suicidal inclinations for our young children. Our children, like the New Green Deal, uh, I think our children are above the New Green Deal. They are our real future. And we should be talking about them as, as, as much as we talk about the Green New Deal. And again, it just highlights the dishonesty in, in government and in, uh, uh, in politics. Um, let's look in our communities. We're now, we haven't been this uh, uh, unsafe in years. New York City, we were talking about po police. New York City used to brag about being the safest city in the, in the country. We're now the, one of the most unsafe cities in the nation. Forget about the country. Because we've demonized the police. We call them racist. Even though we were talking about demographics, there are more minorities in the police department than ever before in the rank and file. Blacks, uh, Latinos, Asians, uh, Muslims, all in our police department in high ranking positions. They represent us, the people. And um, to castigate uh, them as evil is wrong. And uh, let me just talk about one more thing. The attack on homeowners, businesses with taxation is terrible. And again, our elected officials throughout Amazon that would have supported small businesses throughout Astoria and Long Island City would have benefited restaurants, bars, cafes, laundromats, dry cleaners, nail salons, cabs. Thank you, Thank you John. Terrible right. job our government does. Thank you, John. Let's hear from Tiffany Caban. Uh, first of all, thank you all so much for hosting um, this debate and creating a, a space. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Uh, and, you know, I just want to close by saying that I love this community. Quite honestly, it's where I've had the most formative of my experiences, whether they were good or bad. I mean, I, I think about playing Little League Baseball here uh, and, you know, going to the Astoria pool growing up. But I also think about some of my earliest memories, um, you know, one of them being my mother, uh, like pulling me behind a, a car when I was a, a little, little girl in the middle of, of gunfire um, and understanding that there are things that have not changed because our priorities haven't changed and that we have to do better by our people. Um, you know, I began by talking about the definition of a crisis being a turning point and, and how pregnant with possibility, um, that phrase that you enjoyed, uh, this moment is. And I am ready to meet this moment. 
you know, it's a continuation of, of the work I have already done from organizing locally within my community to writing and advising on legislation, to whipping the votes of electeds to pass laws and budget initiatives and helping community groups run, you know, more targeted, effective issue-based based campaigns that then turn into wins for our community. And I love this community and I came into this work, not just because I saw injustice or inequity and wanted to help, but because I've lived it because it is tied to my survival. It is tied to the survival of my friends and my families, you know, from a, a family that grew up in public housing with exposure to violence, to mental health issues, to substance use and economic insecurity. It drives the work that I then went on to do as a public defender and it drives the work that I do today to make sure that we are building the safest, healthiest communities we possibly can and that we can be big, we can be bold and that it is both possible and necessary. And so the last thing I wanna say is you know, please check out my website, kabanforqueens.com. Um, check out my Green New Deal plan because I am a big old policy nerd. It's 20 pages of collaborative community policy. Check out my public safety plan. It is 40 plus pages um, talking about how we create that in our communities. Uh, and again, thank you for the time and space and it would be an honor and a privilege to represent this district. Thank you. And last but not least, Leonardo Bolaro. Thank you, Sky. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for organizing this platform so all of us have an opportunity to share our vision. I'm an education entrepreneur, so anything I've done in my career has always involved a big, bold idea to move the needle on an outcome. So whether it was to start a media-themed high school, to start an after-school program based on design, to work at the Office of Innovation where I was managing $10 million of federal money to put more technology in the classroom, it's always about taking a, a bold idea and implementing it to see results. And I bring that up because that is what we need currently in the state of the city that we're in. We have had uh, staggering, consistent, persistent problems with housing and education and the environment. So you, I, 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 I'm a leader that wants to bring in these new innovative ideas to drive towards change. I'm also a leader that understands that these issues are complicated and nuanced they have to be looked at and observed and studied and they have to bring in different stakeholders. Um, I am a leader that, uh, that uh, leverages my ability to form relationships to solve these problems. And th those are some of the reasons why I'm asking for your vote, your number one vote in the upcoming primary. Visit the website, votebolero.com to read the full platform. And thanks again, have a lovely evening. Thank you to all the candidates. Again, there's so many different issues that we could have dove into, but we only have an hour together. So we like to just touch on a few things and we hope that the voters found this useful. Again, Schneps Media, we are the only platform providing a place where every single candidate can have their voices heard and faces seen. So on behalf of Schneps Media and politicsny.com, check out our website, subscribe to our newsletter. Thank you, candidates. Thank you to the live audience. And this is recorded. Thank you to our ASL interpreters. Thank you and pay attention to our website, subscribe to our newsletter and good luck to everyone. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.